If you would open your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and we uh, began something about four weeks ago that I'm going to finish up with today. Uh, and we've called it Rock House, and, uh, meaning building your house upon the rock. Building your house upon the rock. You know, in Psalm 127, it says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord build the house. That means we want to let God have his way in our life, in our family, in our house, in this church, uh, in our business, in every way. And we let God have his way. And, and by that, we're going to have to do what his word says. Then we can have, uh, we can have his blessing. And we don't have to spin our wheels in life, but we can actually get where he wants us to go and get the blessing that comes from doing it his way. How many of y'all want the blessing that comes from doing it his way? Amen. Well, what's one of the blessings from doing it his way? Well, you don't have vain effort. I mean, you're not wasting time, energy, not wasting money, not wasting weeks, months, or years of your life. You're putting forth effort that will remain. Hallelujah. That, that's what I want. That's what I want for this house. That's what I want for your house. That's what I want for your family or your marriage or your children. That, that things from God's word are revealed and instilled into your heart and into your life so that, hallelujah, your house is built upon a rock that remains. Amen. And the Lord involved in what's going on in your family and in your house. Amen. Y'all got Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 yet? It says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Therefore, who, whoever hears these sayings of mine and what? Y'all can talk back a little bit. Who does them is like a wise man. What does a wise man do? Well, he built his house upon the rock, right? Well, why is, it, why is it wise to build your house upon a rock? Well, he tells you why it's wise to build your house on a rock. Because a storm's coming. Storm's coming. And the storms of life come to everybody. And, and what makes the difference between your house standing and not standing is what your house is built upon and what your house is built with. Right? And I think we've all experienced the storms of life. Some of you may be right in the middle of one right now, and your foundation is being tested. Now, that could be a good or a bad thing, but the reality of it is this, that if you'll get the word on it today, then it can always be a good thing. I mean, you can make it right. You can get it right. You can start building your house on, on what, what will remain if you go ahead and build your house on the rock right now. Start right now. Do it now. So when the storm comes, he says, your house will stand. Your house will stand as opposed to someone who builds their house upon sand. That means that's something that is shifting, something that's not stable, something that's not going to stand the course of time, right? Uh, that's not going to last. You want to build it on a rock. The rock is what? His word. His word, what Jesus has said and what Jesus is saying, what God's word says. That's, that's building your house upon his rock. When you hear it, and when you do it, and that's what we were talking about last week, was the importance of hearing his word, but then, of course, doing his word, doing what, what Jesus has said to do. Now, I, I was reading through this, and of course, uh, in Matthew 7, verse 24 right there, he's finishing up one of the, the most famous, if not the most famous sermon in all of history, which is the Sermon on the Mount. Even people who don't know about Jesus have heard of the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, people who don't believe in Jesus have heard of the Sermon on the Mount. They make fun of it all over the place and talk about it and maybe even take bits and pieces out of it and talk about it. But so, so this is one of the most famous sermons in, in all of history right here. So he's finishing up here. And what is he saying here? Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them is likened unto someone who builds his house upon a rock. Well, uh, of course, I believe, and, and we've been talking about this for the past month, that that's every, every ounce and every word from God. But in, in particular right here, what specifically is he talking about? Well, he's specifically talking about the words he just said, isn't he? You, did y'all already go home or should we just go home anyway? Right? Isn't that what he said? He, whoever hears these sayings, well, what sayings is he talking about? The sayings he just said. I mean, you ever, you ever talk to, you, to somebody, a coworker, or a friend or, or a, a child and you, you, you made a big long list of things and, and after the end of it, you said, now did you hear what I said? Well, that's what he's talking about. What I just said 
is what I want you to make sure you hear and you do, right? Did you hear what I said? He says, so he who hears what I just said and does what I just said is likened unto someone who builds their house upon a rock. Now, one of the craziest things about the Sermon on the Mount is he just, he's pretty much just like, uh, just, just changing everything for everybody. I mean, he's just flipping things upside down, and I mean, he's revolutionizing the way that they think. I mean, he's just, he's just kind of blowing everybody's mind. And so there's a, a whole bunch in here that, that, I, could, that I could jump on here, but there, there's a, a stream of things in here that I want us to see. And if you look back to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, and of course, he starts the Sermon on the Mount with the, the Beatitudes, or blessed are those um, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, and those uh, are who are meek, and those who hunger and thirst and are filled and merciful. But then there's something in here I want you to see here. In verse 21, he says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Mercy. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger for the, uh, of the council. But whoever says, you fools, shall be in danger of hellfire. Boy, he's getting rough. I tell you what, some of Jesus' messages wouldn't fly in most churches nowadays. They go, oh, that's rough. What are you saying? He says, then he says this. He says, therefore, if, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Well, what is he talking about right here? Well, he's talking about reconciliation, isn't he? What is he saying here? He says, if you remember, that means you, it'd be like today. You come to church, it's offering time. You brought your tithe in, your offering, got your offering envelope filled out. But you remember that, that your brother has something against you that you need to reconcile. You know you need to make it right. He says, you go ahead and leave your gift. Now, don't take your offering envelope with you. <laughs> leave it right there. We don't want you to forget about it. <laughs> he says, and you can go ahead and you go ahead and make it right and then come back and then give your offering. Amen. What is he talking about? He says, ha have some reconciliation there. Have some reconciliation. That means there must be a repentance and a forgiveness that is going on between brothers or between sisters. Right? Now, remember what is he saying? He who hears these sayings of mine and does them is like someone who builds a house upon a rock. So then this is one of the things that, that he points out. Now, if you look just a little bit further down in the same chapter, uh, 5 verse 43, he says, You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. What's he doing here? Again, he's turned their world upside down. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So first we have, he says, if your brother's wrong, uh, uh, got something against you, you need to make it right, repent, forgive, all the stuff you got to do to make that thing reconciled. Then he talks about loving and praying for, for your enemies and those who do you wrong. Then he goes on to say in that same passage, he says, it's not that, it's not that uncommon for someone to love somebody who loves them. He says even the tax collector, what is he saying? I mean, even the, the worst of the worst of the heathen of the heathen can do that. He says, but you need to love people who don't love you back or love people who may never love you. Well, even beyond that, love people who, who more than just don't love you, they're using you. They're chewing you up, spitting you out, talking about you after it. He says, those kind of people, he says, now that, that's really, that's really what you're going to need to do to build your house upon a rock. Now, that just doesn't sound right to me. Anybody know what I mean? Like, that doesn't seem like I'm going to build my house upon a rock and I'm going to pray for all the people who hate me and use me. It's going to be awesome. Doesn't sound like fun, doesn't sound all that appealing. But what is he saying here? He's saying, look, look, he's really saying you're going you're gonna to have to love Period. Amen. Love who? Your brother? Your sister? Love who else? Your enemies? Yeah. Who else? Those who spitefully use you and talk about you? He didn't say talk back, talk back to them. He didn't say talk about them. He didn't say blog about them. He didn't say call them out on Facebook. He didn't say none of that. 
Now, and you can call people out without actually calling people out. You know what I mean by that? Like, do you know? I'm not saying your name. I didn't tag you, but you know. I'm talking to you right now. He says, pray for those. I wonder how, many, how much mess we would keep from going on in our lives, in our church, in our families, if when someone talked about us, you said, excuse me, I need to have a prayer meeting. <laughs> Instead of going off. He says, pray about it. Pray about it. Pray about it. Pray, not necessarily even pray about it. Pray for them. Pray for them. Well, not, not pray that they, they get run over by a car. <laughs> y'all, y'all heard that country song where he said, I'll pray for you? Anybody ever heard that country song? He says, I'll pray. I think I showed it a few years ago. I'll pray for you. And it's, he's talking about his ex-wife or whoever he was dating or something. And, and they broke up. And he says, I'll pray for you. And then he says, I, I pray that, you, you know, you, you get in a car wreck and you get pulled over and something falls on your head. And he, start, he starts praying all this crazy stuff. Well, some people, when they say, I pray for your enemies, they say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll pray for my enemies. <laughs> I pray they go bankrupt. Hallelujah. I pray they go crazy because they deserve it. Well, that's, that's not love, and that's not what Jesus is saying to do to pray for your enemies, is it? No. If your heart's really right toward God and toward your brother and to, even toward your enemies, then when they get in a bind, you aren't happy about it. Now, if I'm really honest, there have been a few times in my life when people that I didn't particularly care for or didn't particularly treat me just the way I thought I should be treated, when they got in the bind, part of me was a little bit happy. I'm just being honest, y'all. I mean, a little bit like, well, that's what you get. So you reap. You even get real Bible, can't you? You can get real Christian, real... Real biblical about it. You sow that, you're going to reap that. Uh Uh-huh, you talked about me. Now everybody's talking about you even more than they were talking about me. And that's just your harvest. Enjoy. Enjoy your harvest. Now, it feels good a little bit in your emotions, doesn't it, when you do that? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Y'all look at me so holy. I mean, y'all... Your emotions feel pretty good after that, don't you? Like, yeah, <sighs> yeah, yeah, I'm justified. But if you really check down in your heart, it don't feel so good. I mean, if you check down in your gut, you don't feel so good. Why in the world would you want your brother or your sister to reap a harvest of all that garbage? What are you actually wanting for them? Well, you want God to have mercy on them. You want God to have grace on them. You want God to show them his great love like he's shown you a million and one times. Well, he says you pray for those. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Now, if you look on into chapter 6. Now, we've seen it twice in chapter 5. Now, we're going to see it in in chapter 6 here. And Jesus is is saying how to pray. This is called the Lord's Prayer. How many have heard the Lord's Prayer? Sure you have. He says in this manner, verse 9. Therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, all, all of this sounds really good, like our Father... Mm, oh, Hollywood. I mean, you get all bit Hollywood. Didn't that sound just like a religious word? Like Hollywood. You don't, you don't even know what that means, do you? It's like, Hollywood. Thy name. Thy kingdom come. All will be done. I should have been a priest, man. I should have been. I, could, I can sing. I can wave that stuff, man. <laughs> Probably a good thing I wasn't. No. I, am a, I am a priest unto Jesus, though. I am. We all are. 
No, but, but, but it sounds, your kingdom come. I mean, you can be real religious sounding and pray this. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Got that, God? Hook me up. I need some food. <laughs> House payments due this month. It's due, due, right, coming up in a week, right? Then he jumped, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We skip over that real quick. Forgive us our debts, or, or at least we skip over the second part of it. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Here's the kingdom and the power and the glory. Now, now notice what, what Jesus points out out of everything in that prayer. Come on. What does Jesus point out of everything in that prayer? Well, the next verse he says, for if you forgive, well, I thought we already went past the forgiveness part. Didn't he say, forgive us our debts, we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, the evil one, and thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever, amen. And Jesus is like, but I just want to bring this one point right back out real quick. Right? Of all the things he could have pointed out and brought out, this is what he brings out. For if you forgive, wait, I thought he moved past forgiveness. No, 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 we're going back to forgiveness. For if, if, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Forgive us our debts as, as we forgive our debtors. Now, that, that goes together, doesn't it? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That means those who are indebted to you because of their mistakes or sin or, or where they've missed it. Right? The same, the same way that you're asking God, forgive me when I miss it. Right? He says you forgive others when they miss it. Isn't that what he says? Yeah, somebody said it this way, uh, 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 refusing to forgive is, is, is burning the bridge that you're going to have to pass yourself. That means if you hold somebody to something because of where they missed it, just remember that you're going to have to cross that same bridge at some point in your life. Now, none of you are the Lord Jesus Christ. That means you have sinned before, and you will probably miss it again, and I hate to break that to you, but you may miss it at some point, you know, between now and when you go to heaven, and you're going to need God to forgive you, and you're probably going to need somebody else to forgive you. Right? But what is our tendency? Our tendency is this. After we've had one, two, three, four good days, Anybody with me on this? You've had a few good days where you haven't missed it so much, or at least not where anybody saw anyway. At least it was only in your mind for a while, and then you asked the Lord to forgive you, but nobody knows that. Right? And after four or five days, maybe a week, maybe a few weeks, after you've been doing real good, what's, what's the tendency? Well, just to become a little self-righteous, isn't it? What self-righteous means? I haven't missed it for three days now, but you missed it today. Okay? And you missed it today, but I didn't. Now you better get it right. You better make yourself right. Did y'all hear about so and so? Yeah, they need to get right. Uh huh. Yeah, they did something. You wanna know? I can't tell you. You really wanna know? All right, I'll tell you. You twisted my arm. Now, I'm not going to say this is what they did. I just heard this is what somebody said. Somebody said something. Yeah. No, no, no. That's not, how, that's not what he says to do. No, no. He, he's, you forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. Right? No, no, there's a lot of good prayers to pray in the Bible. This would be a good one simply because of right there in the middle, wouldn't it? I mean, every day you go, oh, Lord, forgive me where I missed it. And, oh, Lord, I forgive everyone else where they missed it. Amen. Oh, Lord, I, forgive, I ask you to forgive me where I've missed it. And, Lord, I forgive everyone else who's missed it against me. Yeah. Right? Now, this brings up something interesting concerning forgiveness. 
How, do y'all, how many of y'all remember Jesus when he's on the cross? In, in the book of Luke, and, and I believe it's the only account that has this in it, but in the book of Luke, it says that Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, I, I don't know about you, but if I, had, if I had been on the cross, I would not be thinking they do not know what they do. Anybody know what I mean by that? I mean, I would be thinking they know what they do. They put the nails in my hand, you know what I'm saying? They just whoop me. They just, I'm right? In your mind and in, your, in, your, in the circumstance, I, they know what they're doing. In fact, in the very passage, while he's on the cross, while he's saying this, they're gambling for his clothes. They've already moved past him to his stuff. Right? And Jesus saying, Father, forgive them for they know. Now that word know means uh, uh, to, to comprehend or to fu- fully understand. That means they don't have full comprehension of, of what they just did and what they're doing right now. What is Jesus doing? He's, he's always looking panoramic. You know what I mean? I mean, Y'all, y'all know, like all, all our cameras, smartphones, you can do a panoramic picture. It's like the big picture, right? I can take a picture of this room, and it'll start from here, and it'll go all the way around to this side. Or I can take a picture of this room and just get this center section. Are y'all with me? And Jesus is always looking like panoramic picture. It's just like he's always seeing everything in an eternal perspective, right? In an eternal, in a bigger, wider perspective than, than just a, a regular old, old person would, right? And so what are we supposed to be doing? Well, we want to be like Christ. How, how are we supposed to see things here? Bigger, wider, right? Jesus is seeing beyond. They think they just put nails in my hands. They think they just hurt my body. They think they they don't really know the full scope. They don't really understand what's really going on right here. They don't they don't really know. And so so to follow his example would be to follow the way he forgives, the way he sees people. How does he see people? How is he seeing people? How how should we view people? Even when it seems like They did something on purpose to hurt me, destroy me, kill me, lay me out, and now they're trying to get my stuff while I'm laying down hurting. In the middle of that, my heart is, I forgive them. They don't even know the true depth of what's going on. That's not that you're Jesus. Don't misunderstand me. Sometimes we can get a little complex about ourselves, though. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't know. I heard, I heard Brother Keith Moore talking about, uh, <laughs> talking about walking in love. And uh, he said, even if somebody slaps you across the face, now that's actually in Summer on the Mount as well. Someone slaps you across the face. He said, you say something like this. Well, I, I am so sorry. You must have tripped or something. And your hand came across right where my face was. <laughs> well, what is, what is our tendency, though? Oh, I'm going to slap the junk out you, man. I'm going to knock all the whatever was on your face off. Right? I mean, I... I I was playing basketball when I was a youth pastor. I was playing basketball. One of my youth leaders accidentally, and it was getting heated, by the way. I don't like to lose. Uh, and, and we weren't, and we weren't going to. But, but I, mean, I don't like to lose. So, I mean, we was getting heated, and the guy elbowed me right in the nose. How I many of those know the, the nose trigger reaction? You lay somebody out. Like, don't touch my nose. Right? So, I mean, elbowed me in the nose. As soon as he elbowed me in the nose, man, I pulled my hand back. This is my youth leader. I pulled my hand back, and I'm like, Dear God, what am I about to do? I'm about to hit my youth leader, man. This is awesome. Woo! Oh, point being, see, we tend to judge others based upon what we preconceive their motives were concerning what they did or said. 
Like I'm prejudging you. But I don't want you to do that to me. Concerning me, just remember, I meant it for good. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not coming from that place. But concerning everyone else, it's a little bit more like, hey, you meant to elbow me in the nose, didn't you? Now I'm going to knock you out. But if you accidentally elbow somebody in the nose and they knock you out, you're like, hey, it was an accident. Right? Now, forgive, forgive, forgive us as we forgive our debtors. Now, Matthew chapter 7. What is he saying here? Building our house upon a rock. Can we all still want to build your house upon a rock? He says, you're going to have to hear these sayings of mine and you're going to have to do them. What does he say? Verse 1, chapter 7, verse 1. He says, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. That's just like Luke 6, 38. Judge not, lest you, lest you not be judged. I like the way somebody said, they said it this way. They said, even God gives people a lifetime before he judges them. You know what I mean? Wait till the end, then there's the judgment. You're going to stand before, everybody's going to stand before the Lord one day. At least he gives you some time to do that. We want to judge people based upon one day. One bad day. Maybe they just missed their medicine on that day. <laughs> didn't, <laughs> didn't have their coffee. Had a bad night, whatever it is. Y'all follow what I'm saying? I mean, right? He says, don't be so judgmental or it's going to come back on you. He said, no, 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 we're not going to be judgmental. Then he says this, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Now, this is an exclamation point. Hypocrite! Y'all, people think Jesus was quiet all the time. And he must have been quiet sometimes, but exclamation point means he was not quiet at this point. He's on, he's on the mount. Hypocrite! <laughs> how many, how many of y'all think people got uncomfortable in their sandals and on a rock they were sitting on? You know, be like, this rock's getting a little uncomfortable. They need to turn the air on in here. I sure would like a cool breeze about right now. You talking to me? <laughs> Probably you. He ain't talking to me. <laughs> now, there's something interesting about a speck and a plank. You want to know what it is? This is just simple observation. A plank is bigger than a speck. How many of y'all would agree with that? How many of y'all been in our, our Connect for you over here? How many of y'all been in the Connect for? Y'all see those pieces of wood on the wall there? It's like a plank there. You know what a speck is? Anybody ever got something in your eye? You know, a little contact. Like I have contacts. So if I get anything in my eye, you can feel it real quick. You get something in your eye. Right, it's just like a little something in your eye. It's like a little speck. Just a little, little something in your eye. Now, there's something about a, a speck can only be seen really close up, right? A plank is something everybody can see. Like if I had a plank sticking out of my eye right now, how many of y'all would be able to see that? I mean, everybody in this room would see that big old piece of wood sticking out of my eye, right? But if I had a speck in my eye, you'd have to get really close to me to see that speck. If I need you to get it out, I'm like, get, you know, get that speck out of my eye. I got, I got something in my eye. Would you, help, would you help me get that out? Remember the eyelash or something in your eye? Like, man, I got to get that thing out, right? Well, he's saying, look, really what, saying, what you got in your eye is big enough for everybody on the mountainside to see. And you're all worried about the little something, something somebody else has got in their eye just because you're so close to them. I, I notice something about you. Did y'all know, did y'all know Jermina, 
she got something on her eye. <laughs> Man, she's so messed up, you know what I'm saying? I mean, when's she going to get it right? Get it right, girl. Man, y'all believe. Y'all believe her sin? I mean, how, how jacked up her life is. How ja now, who's really the fool here? Well, I am right now, but who's really the fool? The person who's trying to point out. What is he saying? Well, he's, he's really saying you need to take a moment. And he talks about doing this before you receive communion every time. Take a moment and judge yourself. What's going on? And even if it's a little thing, big thing, make the adjustment. Amen. It's very difficult for you to help somebody else. I'll say this too. It's pretty humbling as well to realize that you have a plank in your eye. And after you have a plank in your eye and you know everybody just saw it, right? Like, yeah, everybody saw my stuff. Woo, -hoo, great. Everybody knows. Awesome. Then when you're dealing with somebody else's speck, how are you going to deal with their speck? You're going to be a lot quieter about the speck, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because this is already enough, you know. <laughs> uh, this little thing here, just let me help you with that. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, I'm, I want to. It's not a bad heart that's trying to help your brother. Sometimes that's how it gets. Even in church, it's like the circle, you know, it's like the heart toward helping somebody is not necessarily toward helping. It's like it's actually causing more hurt and pain and, right. and garbage. Right. Yeah. If you really help them, you're really trying to, to help. You don't pull that thing out and go, look! Jermina had an eyelash in her eye. <laughs> See, she's not perfect. She's not perfect. <laughs> no, it's stupid. Why? Because I have fallen myself. There's a, another wonderful story in Scripture of Jesus. And Jesus... has a woman that is brought up to him yeah. caught in the act of adultery and it says that they bring them to her and then she's uh, surrounded surrounded now you got to remember Jesus here he grew up in Jewish culture he knows the law he's not ignorant I mean he actually was discussing scripture when he's 12 years old and impressing people. He is not ignorant concerning what the law says should be done. I would probably say in all of his years, he had probably seen people get what they had coming to him from the law based on where they missed it. He'd probably seen people killed by stoning. He grew up in that culture. So they bring this woman to her, caught in the act of adultery, and they're trying to mess with him. They're not concerned about her. They're not concerned about the man that was involved. Clearly, he wasn't there. They're not even concerned uh, uh, about really upholding Moses' law as much as they are trying to mess Jesus up. Because they bring the woman to Jesus say, hey, Moses' law says this such a person should be stoned. What do you say? And I love, I love what it says, that, that it says that he was writing in the dirt right there as if he didn't hear them. Like, ignoring. Like, How irritating would that be <laughs> to the people that are trying to get him all stirred up, right? Come on, let's. <sighs> Jesus says something that many of you have probably heard before. He says, uh, he who is without sin, 
you throw the first stone. He who is without sin casts the first stone. Then it says that they were convicted. There's something. Why? What? They're not just now thinking about Moses' law concerning her. They're now considering Moses' law concerning them. God's law concerning their life. Their, their own mistakes. Their, their own shortcomings. Their, now, we all know Romans 3.23 says, For all the sin that comes short of the glory of God. So everybody needs a Savior. But, but they're all, now everything's kind of shifted from the spotlight on the woman to the spotlight hits the crowd. Whoop! We didn't see this one coming. And it says that in there, see, they started feeling something in themselves, like, ooh, ooh, yeah, mm, yeah. There's no good way for this to end except for us to leave. Because yeah. <laughs> if we say we're without sin, we're like saying we're the Messiah. <laughs> well, that ain't going to work. And we all have sin, so definitely... Uh, can't kill her right now. So it says they started dropping stones, and it says from the oldest to the youngest they left. Well, I mean, you live long enough, you know, you just realize you've missed it more than everybody else too. Right? right? I'm 36. The longer I live, the more I realize we need more mercy than ever. Yeah, need lots of grace. Need lots of help, Right? The younger you are, the more you think you got it all together and you never need grace. But dear God, the older you get, the more you're like, grace, grace. Thank God for grace. Right? Amen. He's without sin, cast, cast the first stone. What is he saying? You need to let her go. He tells her, he says, you're forgiven, but you don't need to keep you living the way you're living. Go and sin no more. So what, what, what's the example that he's setting here? What's, what's the precedent that he's putting into action? Forgiven. Forgiveness. Forgiven. Now, clearly, he wanted her to make some adjustments, but concerning everyone else and their judgment toward her, what was it? Let her go. Let her go. Now, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Y'all are getting this, aren't you? Now, what are we talking about? Building our house upon a rock. That's really what we're talking about, building our house upon a rock. Now, I want you to know some, uh, notice something here in verse 8. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8 says this, the first three words, love never fails. Do y'all see that? Love, What? Come on, everybody just say it. Love never fails. How often? Never. How many times? Never. When's it going to fail? Never. never. Love when? Never, never fails. Never fails. Never fails. So then what, what is the, the, uh, the way to victory? What is the way to keep from failing? Well, love is. Well, is it... Is it uh, does it seem like you're not going to fail when you walk in love? Well, sometimes it seems like you're, you're failing, doesn't it? Like you're getting behind the eight ball because you love, because you forgive, because you believe the best. No, he says love never fails. It's like building your house on a rock, isn't it? Amen. It is building your house upon a rock. Clearly, Jesus and Matthew, he pointed out three or four different things about, about walking in love, believing the best. Forgiving others, making things right, doesn't it? Now, in the Message Bible, in verse 3, it says this. Y'all are a little quiet this morning. <laughs> That's all right. In the Message Bible, it says this. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. 
Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't for, force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others gra uh, grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God, always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. What is this? Love is guaranteed success every time. I said love is guaranteed success every time. Love is guaranteed success every time. Not in, not in the short term, in the long term. On the, on the long haul of this thing, love is going to win. I said in the long haul of this thing, love is going to win. Well, my dad said it this way, you know, people will stir up the devil in you. You know what I mean by that? I mean, they'll get your flesh stirred up. They'll, I mean, people will do things and people will say things. People, what are you going to do? Love. Everybody say love. love. People going to treat you wrong, say things. What are you going to do? Love. You're going to love them. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. You're going to love them. Yeah. Even when they stir up the junk. He says you love them anyway. You forgive them anyway. You know, some people won't accept your forgiveness. What do you do? You love them anyway. The yeah, Bible says, I believe it's in Ephesians, he says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. You know you can't control the wrath of everyone else. You know you can try to make things right, and if they don't want to make it right, at least you can go to bed without wrath. <laughs> you know what I mean? Say, I'm, I'm trying to make it right. They, they will not have it, but I'm going to do it. Forgive me where I missed it. I repent. You know, I'm going to go ahead and forgive you. That may make them mad you saying you forgive them already. But even if they won't have it, at least you took the step necessary and said, I, I forgive, I repent, I'm going to make it right, and I'm not angry. I am not angry. Because some people will be angry for a decade, for two lifetimes. They'll be mad enough for everybody who's not mad. Like, I think they should be mad, so I'm going to be mad for them. And now we all, well, if I can't get that mad, I'm going to be mad. I'm going to have wrath. I'm going to have my wrath. <laughs> no, you say, well, I'm not going to have my wrath. If you want mine, you can have it. <laughs> but I ain't keeping mine. No, I'm going to forgive. I'm not going to keep mine. I'm not going to let the sun go down on my wrath. And I'm going to have peace. I'm going to have peace. Now, last thing. Let's look at one more thing. Can y'all do that? Yes. Mark 11. 23, 24, 25. Of course, great passage on faith. After it gets through talking about faith, and just for the sake of time, we'll just go straight to 25. It says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Yeah. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Same as Matthew 6. Yeah. So he's talking about forgiveness. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. Whenever you stand praying, that means you don't have to try to forgive for 10 years, 5 years, a year, a month, a week, a day. You can stand up and do it. Yeah. I think it's interesting that he talks about forgiveness right after he talks about the way faith works. So then forgiveness is going to have to be done by faith at times too, yeah. won't it? I mean, you don't feel like it. Like, I feel like I hate him and won't kill him, but I'm going to forgive him by faith. You know what that means? You're not going to hate him and you're not going to kill him. You're going to forgive him. Smile at him. Bless him. Put him on your prayer list and buy him a gift card to Copeland's. When you stand praying, what? Forgive. Now, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before. I was, uh, me and our family was at uh, Academy. We were at Academy and... And uh, I don't remember what we were doing there, but, you know, just shopping, looking around. And I, I've got Jude with me. I've got Jude with me. And so we're walking around these elliptical machines. And they didn't have them all out. Some of them were folded up. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Like they're folded up. And so, uh, so we're just kind of walking by. I think I was on the phone with somebody. So I wasn't paying really close attention. I was just kind of letting Jude just look around and just kind of whatever he wanted to do. 
And, um, but I, I told them, stop messing with those elliptical machines because some of them are folded up and they'll come down. And, and some of them, you can get on it, turn on. Who knows what's going to happen once you get hurt. And he's like listening, but he's still kind of fooling around a little bit, you know. And so I'm standing there. And he starts fooling around with this one elliptical machine. And I'm standing there on the phone. And that thing, like a big one, that thing unfolds. Bam! Right on my big daddy toe. Bam! I'm like, oh! <laughs> oh, man. I thought, I thought, I am toeless. My toe has been decapitated. You know what I'm saying? This is... This is the end of Big Daddy Toe. We're going to say goodbye. I'm, I'm going to be like my dad. He's without a thumb. I'm without a toe. All runs in the family. Anybody know what it's like when you feel that? That sort of thing? It's like you feel like nothing for a moment, but you can feel blood pulsating. It's like, woo, 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 woo. Like, I don't know my toe's going to explode or if it's there, if it's gone. I don't even, I don't, anybody know? Like, I don't want to take my shoe off because who knows what it looks like. Man, I just laid there. They, workers come over, what, you know they're nervous. Because that shouldn't have been the way that it was. Uh, they're nervous. I mean, they, they called me for six months. Everything okay, sir? No, 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 no. I want to like, give me a free basketball goal. That's what you need to do. I didn't do it, though. I didn't do it. I mean, took that shoe off, man, and that sucker, man, turning all kind of colors. Now, it ended up, it ended up hanging on there, that toenail. It hang on for, it was ugly. It still ain't, still ain't so pretty, but, uh, but it's there. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, oh, my mercy. Oh, it hurts so bad. They went and got me some ice. My, that thing is flat, man. That big toe's flat. Aaron Cody called me, and I didn't answer the phone. And something or another, she come find me. Everything, she knew something was wrong, basically. She thought I was going to faint, <laughs> which I never do. Workers come over. They're being as nice as they've ever been. I'm ice all over the place. And, you know, I'm like, oh, man. I'm sitting there. And before Aaron gets over there, Jude comes and sits next to me. He knows he hurt me. He knows he hurt me. He comes and sits right next to me. and goes, Daddy, can you forgive me? And I slapped him so hard, I tell you what. <laughs> Bam, boy, I told you to stop playing with the doggone elliptical machines. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. In spite of how bad my foot and toe was hurting, my heart. I mean, just like yours probably just did. Just, oh, just open up like, oh, my boy. I forgive you, man. I love you. Even if you didn't really mean to do it, but sure felt like you meant to do it. There's no way you could have measured that out just like that, you know. I, I forgive you. And you know, as, as much pain as we have caused others and has been brought to us, you know, we're, we're spoke, Ephesians talks about forgiven as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven us, Ephesians 4.32, right? So then our forgiveness is extended toward others in the same way that has been extended toward us. And no matter how bad you think you may have hurt somebody or they have hurt you, God has forgiven you. And imagine all the mess he's dealing with from all of us. And he still is, 1 John 4, 7, 8, he is love. It is love that has been expressed through Christ.